My job is to provide two or three things this morning. One is an understanding of some of the insights from natural science, particularly cognitive science and, system and complexity theory, to the way we think about the interaction between academics, industry, government, in fact, the whole of society. To pick up on a comment from the president, we need to see technology as a tool that can augment human intelligence rather than as something that can seek to replace it. And that requires us to think in ecological terms, not in the terms of manufacturing models and highly processed control. We need to think differently. So my job is to introduce that and to talk about some of the work we're currently doing at government and industry level to make that science into a reality. So some concepts at the start, then some examples as we go through. Uh, I thought I'd start, this is actually a picture of the Brecon Beacons. I'm now an advert for the Welsh Tourist Authority. It's a reminder that we're physical creatures. We exist in a physical universe. And I really want to go through three key things from biology. Uh, one is a concept called acceptation. So adaptation, you all know from evolutionary theory. You know, something evolves for a specific function or purpose over a period of time. So for example, feathers on dinosaurs evolve for warmth or sexual display. And you can see that happening over an extended period. There's no major leap. What then happens is one day a dinosaur with many feathers discovers it can glide between trees. And feathers which adapted for warmth except for flight. Acceptation is where something evolves for one purpose and then it's suddenly used for something completely different. And it explains the massive sudden step changes we see in evolutionary history. That pink thing on the picture there is the cerebellum. It evolved in the higher apes to manipulate muscles in fingers so you could pick seeds from seed pots. It then accepted to manage grammar in human language. Human language could not have evolved naturally. It required something to adapt for one purpose and then leap sideways in a different way. Now, this is really important to understand in the context of innovation and knowledge transfer. So, for example, a Raytheon engineer in the 1940s maintaining the magneto on a radar machine notices that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket. And from that, we get microwave ovens. That's an example of acceptation in technology. And managing for acceptation is not a structured, logical, ordered process. It's managing, for a beautiful English word, serendipity, an accidental coincidence of events which turns out to be beneficial. And to manage for that is very different than to achieve a structured process. The other key concept from biology is coevolution. Coevolution is a key idea as one thing interacts with another thing, patterns form from the interaction. The point is, once the patterns form, you can never go backwards and start again. Anybody with teenage children knows all about coevolution. You can't, when they reach 14, and you realize many, maybe there's something you shouldn't have done around 15 years ago because now life is grief. You can't suddenly reassess your child rearing strategy, call in management consultants, have a clear communication plan and new performance indicators. It just doesn't work. In human systems, you're always dealing with people's perception of the present and memories of the past. There's a key concept here from architecture. In human systems, you never get to build on green fields. You're always building on what's called brown fields, like the industrial material to the left. You're always building on the memories of the past, and you can't go back and start again from scratch. That actually has major consequences for most of the management science fads which have rippled through industry over the last 30 years, which assume you can start from scratch. You can't. Human systems co-evolve. 
And then we move on to human cognition. Oops, I've fallen off the platform here. Uh, human cognition, and I've deliberately shown a picture in here of a neuron cluster. It's messy, it's biological. It doesn't look like a silicon chip in a computer. Now, I'm going to expand on this later, but one of the most fundamental errors of the past 20 or 30 years has been the assumption that the human brain is like a computer and processes information. It doesn't. It's very organic, and there's a whole body of material I'll run through in a minute. In particular, we need to understand it's not just human beings, but it's the systems we operate in. So three core concepts from biology. Yeah? Cognition is different. I'll come back to that. Co-evolution, we always deal with the present and memories of the past. Acceptation, managing for luck is more important than managing with a clear set of objectives if you want to innovate. Yeah? Now, in terms of systems, different types of systems support different types of approach. So we have ordered systems. I'm deliberately satirical here. In an ordered system, you have a very high level of constraint. So all behavior is controlled and can be predicted. Now, there's nothing wrong with order. These days in hospitals, they count the number of surgical instruments left at the end of an operation and check it's the same as were there at the start. As I get older, I think this is of increasing importance. You do not want to know how many surgical instruments were left in people's bodies before that basic checklist procedure was introduced. Yeah, it's quite a scary figure. So we've learned how to manage order. The trouble is we get obsessed with it. And we apply ordered control where it's highly inappropriate. When I was in IBM, we did a, a long project and we identified that the level of perceived bureaucracy in an organization is directly proportional to the density of the informal networks. So as an organization becomes more controlled, more bureaucratic, people have to work harder and harder beneath the surface to make things work despite the system, not because of the system. As a result of which, though it appears to be efficient at the surface level, it's becoming increasingly inefficient beneath the surface, as a result of which, sooner or later, tension builds up and you get catastrophic failure. Uh, government procurement, procurement is a very good example of over-constraint. Yeah, there's an old adage in the IT industry, if you didn't write the RFI, why are you actually bidding? I was in a conversation last night, I won't say about which, which bid, and I said, we're not bidding, this has obviously been written for company X. Yeah, you could absolutely see this was not open procurement, because people have to find ways to make things work. Now, I make no comment on the ethics of that. This is just reality. If you over-constrain a system, if you don't allow human judgment freedom of action, and if you don't train people to exercise judgment, you end up with excessive constraint, excessive control, and a huge waste of actual resources. Right? So nothing wrong with order within boundaries. We then have chaotic systems. Now, there's no agreement in the literature about what is or is not chaos theory. So each one of us who speaks about this has to define what they mean. By chaos, I mean the absence of constraints. There are no constraints. And that brings in two key things for innovation. If I can remove all constraints for a limited period of time, I get complete novelty. But it's very difficult to remove constraints in a human system. It takes a lot of energy. The other use of this is something called wisdom of crowds. So when an American submarine grounded off the coast of Portugal, and they needed to find it, this is in the 1960s, they sent out partial data about its known previous track to groups of experts around the world. Notice they only sent partial data, not complete data, and they didn't allow the different groups of experts to know who the other experts were. They then got each of them to estimate the position. None of them got it right, but the average of all of the estimates was within 150 meters of the actual submarine. Now, there are sound statistical and cognitive science reasons why this works. I now call these things human sensor networks. And at the end of this presentation, I'll talk about the work we're doing 
for whole of workforce and whole of population engagement in mass sense making to increase objectivity under conditions of uncertainty. And that relies on randomness or lack of constraints, i.e. chaos. And then we get complex adaptive systems. This has been with us for our entire lives, but we've only known about them for the last 40 or 50 years. In a complex adaptive system, you have partial constraints which modify behavior, but behavior itself modifies the constraints. So constraints and behavior co-evolve, back to that word again. Patterns form for that interaction. Yeah. Uh, some of the classic cases on this is birds fly around in the sky based on three simple rules. Fly to the center of the flock, match speed, avoid collision. Uh, interest in the Italian drivers south of Naples work on exactly the same principles. This has been studied. I've driven the Olfini coast. I've experienced it at first hand, right? It's flocking behavior. So simple rules give rise to highly complex behavioral phenomena. Yeah. This can't be managed, but it can be governed. Well, it can be managed in the sense of giving direction, but it can't be managed in terms of specific objectives. Now, a simple metaphor to explain this, if you imagine that around a round table you have a series of magnets, and in the middle of the table you have iron ball bearings. If all of the magnets keep the same strength and the same polarity, the iron ball bearings will form a predictable pattern. Not only that, if I change a magnet, the, iron, the pattern of the ball bearings will change in a repeatable and predictable way. The trouble is, the next time I change a magnet, three other magnets change polarity and four other change strength. So the same thing never happens again the same way twice, except by accident. And whereas traditionally we've talked about drivers, what's the driver of human behavior, the driver of innovation, in a complex adaptive system, you have to talk about modulators. The magnets modulate behavior, but they don't produce predictable relationships between cause and effect. Now that has fundamental implications for the way we manage. Because in a complex adaptive system, you can't predict or determine the future you have to manage in the present. And that actually, interestingly, gives whole new opportunities for competitive advantage. So some of the characteristics of a complex adaptive system. Firstly, the constraints I talked about in the literature are called enabling constraints. Without some type of constraint, you just have randomness. So self-organization is not the same thing. You have to decide what's the level of constraints for the level of flexibility against the level of uncertainty. Some of the work I used to do with Max Brasso before he tragically died two years ago was how do we measure the level of inefficiency a company needs to have to actually be adaptable under conditions of uncertainty. Because if you actually make a company too efficient, it loses its capacity to adapt for unforeseen change. And we can actually measure that sort of thing. Now we've got some of the science behind it. So constraints are enabling constraints taken to excess, catastrophic failure, not present, no coherence. You need to get a balance, and you need to change them over time. Secondly, complex adaptive systems are highly sensitive to very small changes. And a small change this year will produce a different effect from a small change next year. Small things magnify to produce major impact. This means that weak signal detection is key. My original work on this was in counterterrorism. It's how do you realize that something which appears trivial and inconsequential is actually highly significant. Yeah, I'm doing some work with Clay Christiansen at the moment with one of the major European companies. And if you look at Christian's stuff on technology innovation, the most successful technology companies don't see the new technology coming, not because they're incompetent, but because it just doesn't seem relevant given the skills that they've got. The patterns of past success actually entrain the inevitability of future failure when new technologies arrive. And one of the big issues I think for Europe, and I've said this in Brussels and elsewhere, is we've got to use the multicultural capability of Europe as a competitive advantage 
and we've got to stop imitating the way the US funds research. It's fundamentally flawed. The US is multi-ethnic but monocultural. Yeah, multiculturalism in Europe and its links with Africa and Asia and Latin America are huge and we need to actually find new ways to manage that and I know that's one of the goals within Trieste. Granularity matters. If you make things too big and too connected, they can't adapt. One of the reasons the web works, our social computing works, is it's small fragmented data items which associate and reassociate very quickly. So getting the granularity right is key, both in organizational design and in information. We'll talk about that later in terms of acceptation. If you make things too big, you know, like I've got this wonderful idea from my academic research, it may be too chunked, yet the granularity may be wrong for a businessman to see the opportunity. You may need to go down a level. And I'm going to talk about how you do that later. So granularity is key. Uh, we need gradients. I mean, the classic case on this at the moment is income inequality. If you have everybody has the same income, there's no gradient, there's no change. If the income is so disparate as it is in Europe at the moment, you now get the preconditions for revolution and catastrophic change. So you need some gradient, but not too much, which actually means getting everybody to have the same values, getting everybody in the company aligned is actually a bad thing to do because it destroys variety, it destroys gradient. Yeah, the, you know, it's an engineering concept, not an ecological concept. You need necessary differences. You need a degree of conflict you need variety in a system, and actually measuring and defining that is key. Proximity and connectivity are key. Again, anybody with teenagers knows this. The thing you most worry about when they hit puberty is who their friends are. Yeah, who and what we interact with is fundamental to what we are as a species. We evolved in extended clans and tribes, and that's still a fundamental pattern in our cognitive structures. So managing interaction is one of the major tools available for managers, not defining outcome, but defining who interacts with who. And again, you're doing experiments on that for the rest of today. It's a good example of this in practice. And then the fundamental principle is we shift from fail-safe design, working out one thing and trying to get it right, into multiple parallel safe-to-fail experiments. We're now doing this a lot with organizations and government alike. If the situation is complex, don't waste time trying to work out what the solution is. Anybody with a coherent hypothesis about what might work gets a small amount of funding to run a controlled safe to fail experiment and those experiments run in parallel. And then the patterns of potential success evolve or present themselves to senior management. This saves a huge amount of money, actually better deployment of resource. It increases agility, adaptability, and sustainability. You can't design a complex adaptive system. You stimulate it with multiple experiments to see what the evolutionary possibilities of the present are. Very small change, massive impact in terms of corporate strategy and the way we work. It's also one of the areas where we start to use academics. For example, Joe Jenner and I in Holiday Inns sent anthropologists into the Holiday Inns group worldwide to study them as anthropologists. That was a safe to fail experiment. We didn't use anthropologists who studied industry. We literally took PhD students from the jungles of Papua New Guinea because we wanted a completely naive perspective on culture and authority. And we got radical new insights. That's an example of safe to fail experiments. You force diversity into the experiments, they're safe to fail, therefore you can actually increase resilience and stability over time. It's all about sustainability. And then finally, we need to realize, and this is one of the most difficult things to get across to people, complex adaptive systems are not causal, they have propensities and dispositions. Propensities are innate qualities of the things, dispositions are the consequences of change over time. So to give you an example, this is called a fitness landscape. Yeah, reversed for the academics amongst you, we actually reversed it to make it an attractive landscape. This is from a major project in Singapore 
measuring the resilience of society through multiple micro-narratives of its citizens on a continuous capture basis. I'll talk about how we do that later. But that landscape demonstrates the evolutionary potential of the system. Hollows are things that people will fall into, peaks are instabilities. Understanding those dispositions are key. We're now doing work, for example, on obesity, diabetes, heart failure, where we're mapping the dispositions of people's attitude to health to manage interventions which will sustain with where people are rather than abstract education about what they should do. In Colombia, micro-entrepreneurship, we're capturing thousands of stories every day from multiple six cities across the whole of Colombia to identify the patterns of belief about microeconomics to allow politicians to intervene to solve small problems rather than talk about big solutions. Managing in the present, interacting in the present, is one of the key things that complexity allows us to run. Now from this, and I'm going to go through this quickly because you can read up on it and I want to go through other material, one of the things I created some time ago is the Kinevin framework. Uh, Kinevin is a Welsh word, it doesn't translate into English. Um, its literal translation is habitat or place, but nobody in Wales would use it for anything that trivial. Uh, what it actually means is the place of your multiple belongings. It's a sense of being rooted in many different pasts which profoundly influence what you are, but of which you can only ever be partially aware. Yeah, it's a very good name for a complexity model because that's a complex adaptive system. The reason why English doesn't have an equivalent, by the way, is they've never had a habitat of their own. They've only ever stolen other people's, and we haven't forgiven them for the 14th century yet, and we don't plan to, right? Okay. So Kinevin takes those three concepts of ordered, complex, and chaotic systems, and it says in human beings, order splits into two, obvious and complicated. So in all ordered systems, the constraints are high, I've got repeatability, I've got predictability. The difference is, if it's obvious, everybody can see what the right thing is to do. So I can apply doctrine, best practice, I sense incoming data, I match it against predetermined categories, I say, this is now what we do. Nice and simple stuff. Business process re-engineering, Six Sigma, all those sort of things fit into that category. When it's complicated, however, there is a right answer, but it's not self-evident. So I have to do analysis or bring in expertise to actually make that judgment. I now can't be absolutely certain I've got it right, so I need to apply good practice, not best practice. That means people with the right training and the right expertise can deviate from one approach. They can produce variety. They can change things a little bit under controlled circumstances. Now that distinction between best and good practice is of critical importance. If you try and force people into one way of doing things when they know there are subtle variations, you end up with that underground movement again. It may appear to work, but the reality is the informal networks are making it happen. Then we get complex adaptive systems, and the model here is to probe. Remember safe to fail experiments? We can only understand them by experimental probes. Time on analysis or expertise is a waste of resource. Understanding this distinction is key. If it's complex, analysis will only make you more vulnerable to threat. You need to move immediately into experimental action. Very different approaches, different things in different spaces. And then the chaos space, which is the space of randomness of complete innovation. Now, just a couple of other points about Kinevin, but then I want to move on to the chaos space. Fundamentally, yeah, Kinevin has a fifth domain, that's that one in the middle, that's called disorder. That's the state of not knowing which of the other domains you're in. And that's where most organizations are at the moment. We assume everything is ordered or could be made ordered. Once you realize that some things are inherently complex, you're suddenly released to manage more effectively and more quickly. Yeah, so being in disorder is a bad state. And obvious is next to chaos, because if you over-constrain a system, you get this collapse. So that bottom squiggle on the model is a cliff. You fall over it. Yeah? It's also important to realize that what you're trying to do is maintain a dynamic control. Whether you're in organizational design, market control, innovation, 
you need to be constantly finding new things in the complex space, safe to fail experiments. As things start to work, you increase the constraints. If the constraints bite, you move them across to the complicated domain, then you can exploit them. If the constraints don't work, you pull back and try again. So you maintain that constant cycle between complex and complicated. Every now and then, you'll need to do what's called a shallow dive into chaos. You need to reset the system because people have become ossified. The behavior is becoming trained. And then only a small amount of material ever goes down into that space because you only move things into the domain of best practice and rigid control where you don't need to change them frequently. Yeah, they go there to die. They may be 80% of your value and take 20 years to die, but the point is they go there when you don't need change anymore. You don't apply those techniques in any area of dynamic uncertainty. Uh, for those who want to read more, that's the Harvard Business Review article, um, one of the 50 most cited papers in management science at the moment, which goes into it, and that's a Gartner report about the use of the model in IT. So that gives you further reading. I just wanted to get that placed. And remember, I talked about chaos. I talked about wisdom of crowds. I talked about the American submarine. The basic principle of this is if a large group of people, independently of each other, perform a routine task, the average of the group is more accurate than the guess of the best individual. That's the principle. So I want to run an experiment with you now to prove the point. Um, if anybody has seen this video before, I don't want you whispering the answer to your next door neighbor. Don't spoil it for people. Right? So I'm going to give you a counting task. Yeah? I'm going to show you a video in which there are six students. Three are wearing white t-shirts. Three are wearing black t-shirts. Your job is to count the number of times the people in white t-shirts pass a basketball. If you've seen this before, put your hand up and say nothing. Okay, if you're right, those of you who've seen it before, don't give the game away. Answer the question the way you answered it the first time you saw it. Everybody got the principle? You've got to count the number of times the people with white t-shirts pass the basketball. If I'm right, the average of the group should give us the right answer. Oh, and just to make it difficult, there are two basketballs. So you're really going to have to concentrate. Okay? Okay, ready, steady, start counting now. Okay, 12 or less, put your hands up. 13, 14, 15, 16 or more. Okay, 14 is the right answer. We've got a normal distribution around that, yeah? And we've had answers as low as four and as high as 38, by the way, all right? Just to say how difference it is. How many people noticed something odd during the movie? Okay, don't feel good about this. There are only three reasons why you did, and none of them are good news, all right? Okay, watch the video again, but this time watch the whole video. Don't count the balls. Especially around now. Okay, how many people saw the gorilla the first time round? Okay, I'd say don't feel good about this, all right? There are three reasons why you would. Uh, one is you've been on too many courses, you know not to follow the instructions, at which point you've lost your capacity to learn, all right? The second is you were half asleep and you woke up halfway through, well, that's okay. The third is you're partially autistic. Yeah, and there's a high degree of partial autism in economics departments and computer science departments in university because it's a positive advantage in those fields. You scan more, you pay more attention. Yeah, in this audience, I think around about a quarter of the people saw it, yet yeah, three quarters didn't. That's fairly typical. Yeah. Now, the whole point about this is that that's what we call a weak signal. Most people don't see it. Not only that, if I ran experiments and told you you hadn't seen it, you would start to believe you hadn't, even if you had. And that inhibits innovation, strategic threat, and everything else. 
So some basic facts about the brain. First of all, that's what we're dealing with. Now, just remember, that's what it is. That's a male brain, by the way. The female brain is about 0.1 of a kilo less, but it's got different structures in it. Right? Firstly, if we go back to the gorilla, the most you will observe of what's in front of you is about 5% on a good day. Yeah? What you then do, having done a partial data scan, is you match it against remembered patterns. So a radiologist looking at an x-ray scans maybe 4% of the x-ray, and they have approximately 20,000 patterns on their brain associated with their skill and training as a radiologist. The most frequently used patterns are near the surface of the brain, so they get activated first. So we do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. Now, in evolutionary terms, you can see the advantage of this. Think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa. Something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to artistically scan all available data, look up a catalog of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having identified lion, look up best practice case studies and company process on how to deal with lions? Yeah. By that time, the only document of any value will be the escape manual from the digestive tract of a large carnivore. And other than the book of Noah in the Bible, I've yet to find a copy of such, right? So kind of like, don't expect to find one. We evolved to make decisions very quickly based on partial data scans. The minute you launch a new program, people don't look at what you say objectively, they match it against patterns of previous such programs. You're always dealing with people's fragmented perception of the present and the past. That's how we make decisions. We satisfy, we don't optimize, we do first fit pattern match, we don't do best fit. As I said before, the brain isn't a computer. It's embodied. Your, your body is part of your consciousness. There are whole aspects of human knowledge which takes two or three years of co-evolution between the brain and the body for you to be able to execute things. So we're embodied essence. This Descartian, Cartesian separation of the brain from the body just isn't true. Yet the two are interacted. We're embedded. We actually create scaffolding through language, through constructs, through tools. If you have a smartphone and you've had it for two to three years, your brain has physically changed to accommodate what the smartphone can do. The tools we give people have biological consequence. And if you don't know anything about exogenesis, we now know that culture changes biology within two generations. If you allow a pattern of unemployment to prevail for more than two generations, you've got a biological problem, not a sociological problem. Yeah? We also extend into our environment. We interact with people in ways you don't know. The brain is far more sophisticated than a computer. It works in very different ways. And also, we have got the difference between an autonomic and a novelty receptive aspect. Now, this is key. If you come across that idea, we have a right brain, which is emotional, and a left brain, which is logical, that's complete and utter nonsense. It has no basis whatsoever in cognitive neuroscience. It's a hark back to some platonic form. Yeah? But we do have one key difference, and there are many, between an autonomic response, so when you pull your hand back from a fire, you don't think about it until after the event. Yeah, that's a way of the brain using less energy. It trains itself to do things based on experience without thinking about them. If that won't work, that's the autonomic side, handle something like 20 million items per second. The novelty receptive side at 20,000 items per second clicks in. But it won't click in unless the autonomic side can't work. And most of the time it does. And it's actually quite scary if you think about it most of the time, you're making decisions very quickly based on entrained patterns. But that's how customers make decisions, it's how citizens make decisions, it's how companies make decisions. And the key thing to remember is that considered in isolation, your brain is not your friend. And this is where we come into human sensor networks. You need to force diversity into the system. And this is a quote from Mark Twain, which makes the point. It's actually not what we thought we didn't know which is the problem, it's where we thought we knew for certain that's where threat and opportunity exist. So that requires us to think very differently about the problem. So let's just do a very simple bit of statistics on this. Everybody's familiar with the bell curve, Gaussian distribution. 
If we assess risk, we do a computer search, all of these things work from one of these. The assumption is if you cover off everything within the middle part of the bell curve, you've done all that can be reasonably expected of you. Anything on the extreme is called a low probability, high impact event, but you can't be expected to manage for it. Now the trouble is you don't often get bell curves in nature. If I do a double log scale of size against frequency, this is a Pareto curve, a power law. You know, a lot of the work on this was actually done in Italy. I was working in Milan on this recently and down in Lecce. Fundamentally on power law mathematics, a double log scale of size against frequency, this is earthquakes. There are a lot of small earthquakes, a small number of large earthquakes. A lot of small financial trades, a small number of large financial trades and so on. I get this pattern, a straight line. The trouble is, if I overlay Pareto on Gaussian, I get that. My so-called low probability event turns out to be a medium probability event. And that switch, which you're now starting to understand, I called it the New Orleans Levies problem. People assess the risk of the New Orleans Levies failing on the assumption that flooding is Gaussian when actually flooding is Pareto. So the probability was much higher than the experts estimated simply by changing the distribution. You can't manage for all possible failure under a Pareto distribution. So you have to manage on the assumption of continuous failure. The key thing is, to quote Bob, is to fail fast, fail early. That's the point about safe to fail experiments. And an organization which survives by constant small failure is called a resilient organization. An organization which tries to prevent all failure is a robust organization and when the accumulation of small failures builds up, it finally breaks catastrophically. Resilience is surviving changed. And that requires us effectively to focus on early detection, fast recovery, and therefore by definition, speedy exploitation. Now if we look at the wider pattern on that, this is coming back to that model, you'll have noticed that on the extreme right, we don't get the straight line. That's because that's a Gaussian universe in which many things happen the same way that they happened in the past. So I can actually forecast the future because I've got enough cases. As I move further to the right, to the boundary between Gaussian, I move away from a domain of that which is probable to a space where the number of things which happened in the past which will repeat the same way in the future is going down, and the number of possible events which might happen in the future is going up. So I'm from a many-to-many -many relationship, I'm going to a few-to-many relationship, and this is traditionally where we do things like scenario planning, which has utility at that point. But as I move further to the right, this is what Jim March famously called the problem of samples of one or less. I can no longer apply inductive or case-based approaches because there simply aren't enough anymore. So the idea I can copy what other people have done is a fundamental mistake. Yeah, and this is where we shift from an inductive approach to research to what is actually called dealing with anything which is plausible, which requires non-hypothesis or abductive research. Now, just to make the logic on this clear, deductive if A then B, inductive all the cases of A have B associated with them, so there's some linkage, abductive, what's the most plausible connection between two apparently unconnected things? And we evolved as a species to think abductively, not inductively, because under conditions of uncertainty, abduction has better survival possibilities. But the trouble is, the minute you construct a hypothesis, you limit what you see to that hypothesis being proved or disproved. So non-hypothesis-based research is key. And it also means we switch from anticipation to triggering anticipatory awareness. Now this leads me into the final part I wanted to talk about, new methods of research, new methods of knowledge capture. Because triggering human beings to a heightened state of alert when they need to pay more attention, remember the gorilla? If I can trigger an alert which says stop counting the balls, look at the whole picture, that's what I need to do. I can't predict the gorilla, but I can trigger human beings to a heightened state of alert. We're doing this on strategic surprise in military environments, social workers trying to work with kids who are gonna be abused, a whole range of cases on this premature discharge of patients from hospitals. These are all cases where you can't predict an adverse event, but you can predict the increased plausibility of an event
to trigger a human being to a heightened state of response. Think about this as a CEO of a company. You want to know when you should pay attention to trivia. Most of the time you want to ignore trivia, but there's times when you really need to pay attention to it. And that's the switch to anticipatory awareness, the ability to know you need to look at something differently. So I think with that, key concept of micro-narrative. Uh, I could have talked about homo narrans. Fundamentally, the way we communicate knowledge is through storytelling. It's unique to humans as a species. Now, has anybody ever filled out an employee satisfaction survey? At some stage in your life, yes, most people, right? Well, you know, but I used to get this in IBM when I worked there. Does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time? And you know exactly what the answer is. And just to give you some basic facts, by the way, if you give people a questionnaire, they never answer it honestly. They gift an answer or they game an answer because they know what answer you want. If you actually conduct an interview, once you've done three interviews in a company, your brain forms a subconscious hypothesis and you literally only hear things that match that hypothesis thereafter. Focus groups are fatally biased within 15 minutes. So we take a different approach. We actually gather stories from 10% of the staff every week or every month, and we ask them, what's the story you would tell your best friend if they were off the job in your company? Because actually narrative is the way we communicate complex ideas. We then ask to interpret those, and this is one of the triangles we use, was the manager's behavior, where did it sit in balance between analytical, assertive, or analytical? Now notice those are three positive qualities. So you don't know what the right answer is. It takes people five times as long to place something on a triangle as to answer five multi-choice questionnaires. Because the novelty receptive part of the brain is engaged, and I'm getting quantified data in what traditionally has been a qualified domain. That allows me to do what's called distributed ethnography. So we have a project just east of here at the moment. We've got Roma children acting as field ethnographers into Roma communities, capturing stories in oral or written or picture form, self-interpreted the point of origin by the Roma communities. And we're getting data that nobody in Europe has ever seen before because the ethnographic function moves to the people concerned themselves. In Africa at the moment, we've got young girls who've been subject to genital mutilation and rape. They're now acting as field ethnographers to people in their own communities at risk for similar events. And again, because the power of interpretation is transferred to the respondent, we're getting data we've never got before. And the really scary thing, we did controlled experiments for the UN on this, you take stories indexed by Roma, present them to Roma experts in Vienna, and they don't index them the same way that Roma kids index their own stories. There's a complete difference between the two. Yeah? Interpreting raw data is very dangerous as an expert or with a computer. You need self-interpretation from customers, from employees, so you can see statistical patterns. And that allows us, for example, in health, this is from Australia, we can now start to look at the patterns by individual communities. So instead of managing for the average of the bell curve, we manage for differences by extreme because we can represent the data in real time. Each of those dots represents a story. This is an example of a culture scan. That's stories told by employees indexed by the entire workforce. That shows, in this case, the company is heavily bad, bad skewed towards analytical approaches. There's very little in terms of intuition or speedy decision making. Now, it's not any of these things are right or wrong, but now I go to HR and say, how would we get employees to tell more stories like this and fewer stories like that? Because that's a change in the way we communicate. In Mexico at the moment, where we're doing counter narco work, we're going to people of goodwill and saying, how would you tell more stories like this and fewer stories like that? Not how would you create a culture of legality so we engage more people? And that's a non-hypothesis-based method of research to see patterns. Yeah. So I kind of like conclude on this. Remember I talked about human sensor networks? Experiment run five weeks ago with the entire American intelligence community in Miami. We presented a statement about Syria and got different agents with high expertise to index the statement in isolation from each other and looked at the pattern. 
In Zurich at the moment, I've got companies who can consult the entire workforce during a board meeting to give objective statistical measures under conditions of uncertainty. So in situational assessment, the ability to engage a large human sensor network means some people will always see the gorilla and your eye is actually drawn to it. And of course, I can go from the dot to the actual story. So, I said I'd come back to acceptation at the end. Real case and innovation. On the left-hand side of that model, each of those represents a story told by a consumer about their gardens. Now, we were working for a large lighting manufacturer. The principle here is they had the idea, if we buy lights as part of our garden, rather than just to light our garden, then we got a whole new market. Nobody had thought about that before, innovative idea. So we pulled in stories indexed by people across five European countries, Twitter feed, one euro per story, very cheap market research, and those are the ones on the left. We then got everybody in the different technical silos of the company to index all of their core technologies at a low level of granularity. Yet individual filaments and switch controls, not big units. They didn't know what the consumers want, and that's the stuff on the right. Remember acceptation, accidental coincidence? We mashed the databases together, and we got three patterns. One is clusters of customer stories linked with technologies. And marketing people looked at those and said, why are those linked? Three of those are now multi-million dollar businesses. Because it allowed technology developed for one purpose to move sideways quickly into a completely unrelated field. But we also saw stories without technologies and technologies without stories, which actually starts to tell you about different ways of investment. Now, I wanted just to go through that sort of thing at the end, because it's not just about getting people together and having discussions. We need to build systematic capability into the whole of organizations at a network level between government, industry, and academic life, so we're constantly interacting at the right level of granularity. Complexity theory gives us a science to understand how to manage that. Our own intelligence and our ability to work collectively gives us the ability to exploit it. But it's key, to quote Lincoln, that we don't just have to act differently, we have to think differently. And nations and companies and regions who act in you and think in you will be the new dominant predator of an ecology which is only just emerging. And you don't want to be anything other than a dominant predator in a new ecology. Thank you very much for your time.